Welcome to Human Monsters. When the world shut down during the pandemic as COVID reared its ugly head and lockdowns began, logic abandoned ship for many people for a while. It was like suddenly they could recall every doomsday movie they'd ever seen, and for a brief moment in time, they thought that it might just be Armageddon, and thereby Armageddon as they knew it. Thank goodness common sense prevailed, but following the breaking news on people's phones, I realized what a tremendous effect this sudden change of reality must have had on those already battling mental illness or other emotional and psychological challenges. What I am going to tell you is, in my view, the story that stuck out the most as an example of how people were affected by the pandemic and all the changes it brought about. Now that people are being vaccinated and life is returning to normal, I feel more comfortable with the story I'm about to tell you. So, pack your imaginary travel bag and don't forget to dress warm because today we're going to Canada. Ah, Canada. The Great White North. This is one of my favorite countries in the world, and I can become lyrical about the land of maple syrup, ice hockey, and snowy winters. As a kid, I used to watch a show called The Mountie, with a manly yet polite RCMP officer on a horse solving the crime problems of the folk of rural Canada. My imagination was swept away by the authentic and rustic vibe and simple life people in these small communities would live. I could easily imagine myself in a wooden cabin, warming in front of a log fire, surrounded by the enchanting forests, scenting the air with the fragrance of fern, moss, and pine. It is here, in Canada, that our antagonist was born, a man named after an angel who would unleash hell. On the 5th of July, 1968, Paul Wartman and his wife welcomed their son, Gabriel, into the world. For many years, Gabriel would believe that he was the only child of the couple, but later his parents would reveal to him that he had another brother, who they gave up for adoption because they were in no way able to take care of the little boy. Paul Wartman was not a nice man. He is described by relatives rather unflatteringly as a manipulator, a petty thief, and an abuser. Like his father and his grandfather before him, he solved problems with his fists, and once in a rage, your age or gender did not matter. During one violent episode, Neil, Paul's uncle, who was a boarder in Paul's house, Witness Paul straddling while choking his wife, and Gabriel, still a toddler, watching in silent shock. Despite the domestic violence he frequently witnessed, he did well at school and was, by all accounts, well-adjusted. He had two uncles in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and he always expressed the desire to become an RCMP officer even depicting this dream in an annual yearbook below his picture. For whatever reason, Gabriel Wartman did not become an RCMP officer. He first became a mortician, and later a denturist. He had a successful business owning two practices in Halifax and Dartmouth, his clients described him and his partner, Lisa Banfield, as kind, gentle people, often joking with each other. On the surface, they looked like just another couple who lived and worked together and seemed content with life, but this could not be further from the truth. Gabriel had a dark side. He was a proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing. Those who knew the denturist well knew his ugly side, and saw the snarl and felt his claws. Business partners would often complain that he did them in with deals. 
He was described as ruthless, shrewd, and an alcoholic who could not control his temper. In 2010, Gabriel arranged a reunion between him and his adopted brother at the summer home he owned at Porta Peak. The event, which was supposed to bring the family closer together, ended in a vicious fight between Gabriel and his father about a property dispute. Gabriel's brother wisely took one look at the dynamic of his blood relations and swiftly decided that perhaps some people should not be reunited. After this event, Gabriel was reported to have threatened to kill both his parents, but apart from the complaint being documented, no other actions were taken. Wartman's one and only run-in with the law came in 2002, when he and an accomplice beat a 15-year-old boy unconscious for standing too close to his dentist practice. The attack was completely unprovoked, and the boy would testify that both men reeked of alcohol. He was sentenced to nine months on probation and was ordered to attend anger management classes. He was also prohibited from having any firearms or ammunition. His arsenal, to say the least, was incredibly impressive. Some firearms had even been smuggled to him from America after being purchased at gun shows. As with all narcissists we encounter, his fearless arrogance was unnerving to those who knew him well. His inflated ego was amplified by his substantial wealth that, by all accounts, he did not always obtain with integrity. Relatives would describe him as a career criminal who never got caught. In the 19 years Lisa and Wartman were together, she never brought charges of domestic violence against him, but it was no secret that Wartman abused Lisa on a regular basis. Brenda Forbes bought her retirement home in Porta Peak, and since the Porta Peak community at most consists of about 150 people, the two neighbors quickly became friends. Brenda would notice at house parties how controlling and domineering Wartman was towards Lisa. But the entire scope of the abuse came into light when a badly beaten Lisa came to her door one evening, begging for help. Brenda insisted she leave the relationship, but Lisa worked for Wartman, owned nothing, and was completely dependent upon him. So inevitably, she went back to him. This is not unusual in long-term abusive relationships, and studies have shown that a woman on average leaves an extremely abusive relationship eight times before making a final break. The logistics involving a controlling and abusive partner, especially if you are isolated and without resources, can be daunting. Wartman, however, saw Brenda's interference as an unforgivable slight. Lisa was forbidden to have any communication with her, and Wartman used soft intimidation tactics until Brenda no longer felt comfortable in her own home. She finally had to sell her dream retirement home and moved away from Porta Peak. Most of the time, Lisa and Gabriel lived in their apartment above the denturist clinic in Dartmouth. A massive, toothy smile advertising the services of the denturist hung above the entrance to the clinic. The sign was a landmark in the town. It was, however, the summer home in Porta Peak that Gabriel took the most pride in. He went all out in refurbishing the cottage, and it was evident that he was a collector. He seemed to have a special interest in collecting anything related to the RCMP. Amongst his prized possessions were the four RCMP vehicles he bought on auction, uniforms of officers he had systematically collected piece by piece over the years, and a very impressive firearm collection, which he would show off at any given moment. Although his passion for firearms unnerved them, neighbors wrote it off to his obsession with the RCMP, 
and the fact that he had two uncles in the force. Lisa would later reveal that Wartman could not stand the police. He would often call them pigs and express the dark desire to kill one of them one day. By the end of 2019, neighbors became concerned with Wartman stockpiling gasoline and propane tanks, and, even more disturbing, he bragged that he had hydrochloric acid in the event that he might need to dispose of bodies. Wartman's rusty hinges were concerning, but without any evidence that a crime was being committed, the allegations were never investigated. If they had been, perhaps police would have been able to discover the arsenal of firearms and ammunition Wartman had collected, pretty much all without a license, and perhaps his entry into the books of history would read differently. As more and more cases of people contracting the COVID-19 virus increased and the first deaths were reported, the government of Canada, like the governments of many countries across the world, started implementing measures to restrict the spread of the disease. Businesses were ordered to close down, gatherings were restricted, and traveling was not allowed. People were ordered to stay at home and isolate until further notice. An almost apocalyptic aura filled every corner of the world. And for survivalists like Gabriel, it meant preparing for the end of the world. He stated as much in an email he sent to a friend, ending with the words, Thank God we are well armed. It would also emerge that he was concerned with the loss of income his clinics would have to endure while closed. While his assets estimated in the millions... It seemed a loss of income should be the least of his concerns. His paranoia increased, and during March 2020, he withdrew almost half a million dollars from his bank, which he buried in the fire pit at his home in Porta Peak. Still, the residents of Porta Peak viewed the denturist as nothing more than an eccentric and often difficult neighbor. On the 18th of April, 2020, Lisa and Gabriel were celebrating their anniversary when an argument broke out. Gabriel and Lisa left the festivities. It is unknown precisely what the argument was about, but what we do know is that Wartman continued the argument at their home, during which he once again assaulted Lisa. At some point, the argument must have lost steam, because Lisa would later state that she was awoken by Wartman firing shots from a gun at her. The assault continued, and Wartman eventually tied Lisa up and loaded her into his most prized possession, a replica RCMP vehicle that he had with painful care, decked out to look exactly like any other cruiser the RCMP was currently using. There are no exact details about her injuries, but the fact that they were the most severe she had sustained during any of Wartman's attacks frightened her. Her fear increased when she asked him if she should help by moving one of the vehicles, and he responded, Do you think I am stupid? She struggled against her bindings and managed to free herself. While Wartman was loading the mock RCMP cruiser with firearms, gasoline, and ammunition, Lisa made a break for it and fled to the woods. As Lisa watched from the trees where she would hide from Wartman until the following morning, she witnessed in horror as he set the cottage he was so incredibly proud of on fire. Wartman, now dressed as an RCMP officer in one of the uniforms he had collected over time, searched amongst the brush for his spouse, but gave up quickly. The moon was waning, and the Bay of Fundy seemed much darker than usual. Capone had his goons dressed as policemen to execute the St. Valentine's Massacre in 1929. It was 10 p.m., and the Nova Scotia nightmare had just begun. Greg and Jamie Blair were a popular couple in Porta Peak, described as the life of the party. Both worked at a gas company nearby, 
which had closed temporarily due to the pandemic. Witnesses would later tell that Greg and Jamie were part of the gathering earlier in the evening and that Wartman attacked the couple, perhaps because they might have been hiding Lisa from him. Greg was Wartman's first victim. Wartman gunned him down while he was standing on his veranda, possibly curiously looking at the fire that had erupted from Wartman's cottage. Jamie heard the shots and immediately called the police while shouting for her two young boys to hide. This would be the first of many calls the RCMP would receive during the next 13 hours. And puzzlingly enough, the call was logged as nothing more than a firearms complaint. Wartman burst through the front door and he shot Jamie, killing her instantly. Wartman then continued to spread logs from their wood fire across the cabin in an effort to set the cabin on fire. Fortunately, the two boys who were hiding in the chicken coop were not discovered. Lisa McCulley was described as a dedicated primary school teacher with a passion for music. Her sister would describe her as a hippie child, and during the pandemic, video footage of her singing while playing the ukulele was streamed to the students she loved so much while teaching them remotely. As the fires started to rage and the gunshots rang, Lisa told her two young children to hide in the basement. As many would, Lisa had begun making her way to the scene of the chaos to assist in any way she could when she encountered Wartman. He shot her dead in the middle of the road. Once the Blair boys saw the coast was clear, they made their way to the Macaulay house where the four children sat with a 911 operator for almost two hours, not knowing what had happened to their parents. Wartman, in typical injustice collector fashion, had a list of people he believed had wronged him, and in his mind, he was taking revenge. Why he would randomly start killing the people he encountered, no one knows. Conflict with Wartman seems to be a running theme in all Wartman's interactions. From what we can gather, Wartman tried to buy Aaron Tuck's cottage a couple of years previously. Wartman tried to do him in. Aaron fought back, and ever since, the two had bad blood between them. Aaron, his wife Jolene Oliver, and their daughter Emily Tuck were a close-knit family. Aaron and Jolene met when he was a mechanic, and she was a waitress two decades ago, and the flame of love between them never faded. Seventeen-year-old Emily was the apple of her father's eye, and she would happily tinker on cars with her dad for hours. They were actually in the process of revamping a Pinto, which would be gifted as a graduation present to Emily. She was a dream teenager. Her down-to-earth temperament set people at ease, and judging by the performance she gave during the Tuck family's contribution to the Nova Scotia kitchen party on Facebook, you can tell she is an accomplished violinist. The chords from that specific YouTube video would follow me long after my research into this story was gone. The family was unprepared for the attack, and Aaron, Jolene, and Emily were gunned down in their home. Forty-two-year-old Corey Ellison was listening to music and relaxing with his brother at their father's cottage when they became aware of the commotion outside. Concerned by the increasing fires in the area, Corey decided to have a closer look, despite his brother Clinton telling him not to. Corey did not make it far from his father's house before Wartman gunned him down. Clinton, becoming uncomfortable with the length of time his brother was away, decided to go and look for him. His shock at finding the body of his brother on the side of the road was quickly replaced with panic as he realized that the gunman who killed his brother was bobbing his flashlight across the terrain, evidently looking for more victims. Like Lisa, Clinton looked to the forest for protection 
and would later tell police of the terrifying experience, waiting for two hours in the icy cold while a madman was hunting people as if they were prey. Don Galenshin and John Zoll were an elderly couple who owned their retirement home for almost a decade. After many years of being separated from her husband due to work as a caregiver, Dawn finally decided that the time had arrived to hang up her uniform and take the business of retirement a little more seriously. Wartman killed them and then set their house on fire. He then moved to the home of the elderly couple Joy and Peter Bond, committing two more homicides. He also encountered Joanne Thomas and killed her with a single gunshot. The first RCMP officers were on the scene within half an hour, and they encountered a site of utter devastation, with fires raging from three separate structures. They encountered an unnamed victim Wartman had shot in the shoulder, and the magnitude of the problem became evident when the victim told police that Wartman was not only dressed as an RCMP officer, but that he was also driving a vehicle closely mimicking an RCMP cruiser. Still, this information was not released, and the RCMP would later receive harsh criticism about their lack of action. Since the only way out was Beach Road, a roadblock was established, but hunted fugitive Gabriel Wartman knew the lay of the land like the back of his hand. Cutting through a blueberry field, Wartman made his way to Dartmouth, and while confused and disoriented officers were searching for the armed and dangerous suspect in Porta Peak, he spent the next couple of hours behind a welding factory resting. By 6 a.m. on the 19th of April, 2020, Gabriel Wartman was ready to finish the destruction he had begun. Whether Wartman and his hunting buddy had a disagreement or whether Wartman was just after his firearms, we don't know. What we do know is that his next stop was at the home of correctional officers Alana Jenkins and Sean McLeod. He wasted no time executing the couple at their Wentworth home on Hunter's Road, after which he spent some time in their house. 9 a.m. Wartman was on the move again, having set the couple's house on fire. Tom Bagley, a volunteer firefighter, saw the smoke and rushed to help, only to encounter Wartman, who gunned him down in the road. No one expected a madman armed to the teeth and dressed as a police officer would be roaming the streets of Nova Scotia. As the bright spring morning unfolded, drivers, pedestrians, and residents were unaware that something had happened in Porta Peak of such ominous and destructive proportions that it would exceed the diminutive community's ability to heal. In the meantime, Life in the small scattered communities continued as if it would on any given Sunday. 64-year-old Lillian Hisloff was taking her usual Sunday morning walk when she crossed paths with Wartman. Like the others, he fatally wounded her and left her to die at the side of the road. Next, he shot and killed a Victoria Order of Nurses member, Heather O'Brien, on her way to visit the first of her eight children, the way she always had on her days off. 33-year-old Christine Beaton would suffer the same fate as she made her way to work that morning. This young mother was pregnant at the time she was murdered. Officer Chad Morrison, an 11-year veteran of the RCMP, had arranged to meet Officer Heidi Stevenson, a 20-year RCMP veteran along Route 2. Officer Morrison saw what he presumed was Officer Stevenson's vehicle, but by the time he realized he had been ambushed, 
he had sustained two gunshots. He was, however, one of the fortunate ones, and he was able to drive himself to safety. Officer Heidi Stevenson was not as fortunate. Her cruiser collided with that of Wartman, and she was killed in the ensuing gun battle. Oblivious to the anarchy taking place in this area, father of three, Joey Weber, was driving along Route 2 when he came across the scene where Officer Stevenson had met her demise. He must have mistaken Wartman for the real deal, since no warning had been issued that the suspect was impersonating a police officer. He stopped when Wartman ordered him to. Wartman put the young father in the back of his mock police cruiser, shot him, and proceeded to set both cars on fire. He then stole Joey's silver SUV and was presumably on his way to Halifax. At one stage, he tried to gain entry to a house of a couple he knew, but they had by then heard about the rampage and just pretended in fearful silence not to be at home. He even pretended to be one of the RCMP officers by shouting, Gabriel Wartman, come out with your hands in the air. Thankfully, the couple did not fall for the ruse and notified the authorities of where Wartman was. Single mom, Gina Golay, was, however, not as lucky. She was also a denturist, but it is unclear what, apart from their occupation, could connect them. This survivor of cancer twice would be the last of Wartman's victims. Wartman stole her Mazda 3, but at the truck stop at Enfield, he realized he needed to put gas in the vehicle. Quite by accident, two RCMP officers pulled in at about the same time. They immediately recognized him, and a gunfight ensued, during which Gabriel Wartman was shot and killed, ending the worst spree killing in the history of Canada thus far. During his 13-hour rampage, Gabriel Wartman killed 23 people, including himself, and injured three. Five separate structural fires were reported, and investigators had 16 different crime scenes to process. Slowly but surely, the people of Nova Scotia were faced with the reality that, yes, indeed, something like this happened in their backyard. Families were informed of the death of loved ones, and you can tell by the on-camera interviews that Canadians were struggling to come to terms with what happened. Virtual vigils were held observing the no-contact rule and the fact that people could not touch, hug, or give any other form of physical comfort affected Nova Scotians tremendously. All the people who died that day, except for Wartman, were good, solid, salt-of-the-earth people. We are talking about a teacher, two nurses, and a caregiver, an RCMP officer, a volunteer fireman. Across the province, people would pay homage to the victims in their own special ways. Ambulances would let their sirens blare, bells were tolled, and the sad and lonely sounds of bagpipes acknowledged the pain and sorrow Canadians felt during this time. I am not going to spend too much time on what the RCMP did right or wrong. Clearly, they dropped the ball by not releasing details such as that the gunman was dressed as a police officer and lives could definitely have been saved by people staying clear and out of his way. Three people, including Lisa Banfield, Wartman's partner, were arrested for assisting him in illegally procuring firearms and ammunition. But other than that, nothing more came from the inquiry. The talking heads would, however, highlight the fact that RCMP officers are underpaid and overworked and that the entire structure of the RCMP should be reviewed. Several lawsuits representing the victims of the Nova Scotia massacre have been filed, but the outcome of these suits are not public. No investigation, inquiry, or review, no matter how extensive, could explain the whys and hows loved ones were left to ask. 
In Dartmouth, the big sign with the toothy grin above Wortman's clinic was finally taken down after the community petitioned the town council to remove it. Just like other shared structures in Porta Peak, it reminded people of the devastation and heartache Wortman left in his wake. Many of the folk in Porta Peak had opted to rather sell their properties because the memory of those two days was everywhere they looked. In a small community like theirs, it's impossible not to be affected by even one murder, let alone 22. A psychological autopsy of Wartman was conducted, and he was identified as a typical and classic injustice collector. He fit the profile of a middle-aged man with anger issues and a list of small and large grievances that he had accumulated over the years. It was obvious that he had planned the attacks, and the trigger more than likely was the argument he had with Lisa. Lisa would later tell police that the COVID-19 pandemic played a role in the unraveling of his already fractured mind. If you are anything like me, you can handle anything done to a human being, but the moment you hurt an animal, I lose my mind. I have some good news to end this episode on. Though Wartman had shot the Blair family's dog as well as Gina Goulet's dog, named Ginger, a veterinarian managed to save the lives of both dogs, and Ginger now lives with Gina's daughter. The two orphan Blair boys were reunited with their furry friend. This case was written by Miss Demeanor. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.